Hi, I'm Yo, Executive Director of Open Life Science. OLS is a program designed to help people who are interested in open research practices learn how to apply them to their research, whilst learning community building and inclusivity skills. We run two training cohorts a year, where people apply with a project in mind, get assigned a one-to-one -one mentor, and participate in cohort calls, where we discuss various topics both on open research, such as open access, open data, and on topics uh, around inclusive community building, such as designing contribution pathways and LI skills. You can see me on the bottom right. Working upwards, the other co-organizers are Malvika Sharan, Emi Tseng, and Berenice Batu. But we're a lot more than that. We're really 372 people who have been speakers, mentors, mentees, and core facilitators. Many people have held more than one of these roles, and we come from six out of the seven continents in the world. We're really proud to have such a global network of people. I'll share some of the things we do to build this. So we use this slide quite a lot. Quite often when we say open, we might be referring to open research techniques like open access or open code or open data. But it's also about how you design the community experience to have as many different kinds of people participate and lead and how you welcome people. We believe that openness shouldn't be a thoughtless default, but something that is consciously designed into what you're doing, carefully thinking about the ethics and implications at every step. And we're an online program. So we've tried to analyze what might block people from participating in online calls. We don't have answers for all of these, but many of these are specific things that we've seen happen in online calls over the last few years. Volunteering to solve these for people will take you a long way. So some of these might be the internet being either very expensive or very unreliable, not having power, which can be worked around with batteries and mobile tethering sometimes. Expensive supply chain for electronic goods can also be a big blocker. So the same headset might cost twice as much in a lower or middle income country compared to a high income country. Webcams are often optimized to work well with lighter skin tones and in well lit spaces. And people not, might not be able to find uninterrupted time and spaces to take calls. Uh, so this chart shows some of the ways we've handled getting equipment to people to help them participate in calls. On the right hand side, you can see the advantages and disadvantages of different methods. When you purchase and ship something directly to people, that's great so long as the postal system is reliable. If the recipient purchases something on their own and then gets reimbursed, they may have to shoulder a cost that is very, very challenging for them. Money up front can be much more flexible, but you may struggle to get the receipts that you need for your accounting systems. And shipping things internationally can get very messy with import tax and slow shipping. We've learned that one of the most important parts about promoting diversity and inclusion this way is flexibility. There is no one size fits all. And if you try to force it, you'll be losing people on the way. I suspect this applies in many other scenarios beyond just shipping people small technological items. And I'll move on to what we teach rather than just how we get people there. So this is the curriculum of the 16 weeks that we work with people. And many of these topics are specific technical skills that allow people to apply open research behaviors to their work. But also all of the ones that I've annotated here with tulips are specific things that embed inclusivity into what we're teaching. On the bottom left, we talk about codes of conduct as one of the earliest things to set expectation for how people would behave in your community rather than letting it become an accidental default. We talk about intentionally designing your community for inclusive interactions, pathways for contributions, and trying to learn what biases you may have so that you can combat them. We also host a career call where we tend to invite one person from a traditional academic lab of some sort, but all of the others tend to be industry or funders or policymakers or nonprofits or perhaps small startups with the goal of recognizing that open research success has many shapes. And finally, we talk about ally skills, which help, helps people learn that if they're in a position where they have some power or privilege, how they can take, that, uh, take advantage of that power and privilege to stand up for others as well. And I'm nearly out of time. We try to teach inclusivity as well as embodying it. Uh, now, I know that we don't always get it correct, but we're always willing to listen to what we've done wrong and to try and improve it and do our best to share what we've learned on the way. Uh, so if, you, if we can help you in any way, then we're very happy to do so. That might be in-house consultancy, on mentoring programs, on inclusive online collaborative calls. Uh, we offer ally skills workshops. And we also offer one-off advice sessions. Um, also, feel free to encourage your community to sign up to OLS 6 to learn more themselves. Um, you can learn more on our website, openlifesite.org. Thank you.